Great. So I, I get to introduce, this is uh, Ben Chu, uh, who is joining us today uh, from uh, UCLA, where he's finishing up a PhD, uh, working with uh, Ken Lang and Janet Sinsheimer, uh, and focused on, well, he's going to talk to us today about, uh, well, as you can see, scalable algorithms for genetic association, genotype imputation, and ancestry inference. Um, and I believe this is part of maybe the, the new implementation of Mendel um, as well. Ben can correct me if I'm wrong there, but he also comes, um, you know, background from Berkeley, uh, BA in applied mathematics and expertise in uh, penalized regression methods, uh, big data, high performance computing, and so on. So without further ado, here's Ben. Um, thank you, thank, thank you very much. So yeah, I guess I'll get started now. Yes, go ahead. Um, so for today, what I plan on talking about is basically my two projects that I did. Um, for both, we will go over the motivation and then what we did. And I'll also try to highlight some of the potential future projects um, that hopefully some of you will find interesting. Um, so the first part is this iterative heart thresholding, it's a new kind of algorithm and we apply it to these genome-wide association studies. So I'll define both of these terms later. So currently the paper is, is published and you can see it at this link. Um, you can also access our software and documentations um, at these links. So first, the, these genome-wide association studies is what we're trying to analyze. These are some kind of data. So this data, we're, we're basically trying to study the genetic basis of some phenotype, right? This phenotype is usually continuous, like, like height, but, but it doesn't have to be. It could also be binary. Um, whether or not patients developed cancer, or it could be like count data, right? Um, how many seeds per plant. So if you want to study these genetics, what people do is you can collect n samples. And then for each sample, you will look at p specific positions of their DNA sequence. So p is usually like at about a million, whereas there's three billion base pairs total, right? So p is usually much smaller than three billion. But you will collect these data, and then you will assemble this design matrix X, which is n by p, and each entry is 0, 1, or 2. Um, you will also measure each individual's phenotype. Um, so these are you know, the height or whether or not you get cancer. So given these two data, you, you basically ask which SNPs are, or which genes are associated with the phenotype. And that basically amounts to asking which column of this design matrix is, is associated with, with Y, right? Is that clear? So um, this is super popular, right? It's everybody today in genetics, they, 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 they do this at some point. So naturally there are a lot of methods to do it. Um, here I summarized three main methods plus the naive method, right? So in the naive model, you can just do it's very naive, right? You just have a standard linear model, y is equal to x beta plus some iid f epsilon. If this is your model, you can just solve the least squares problem, and it has this estimator, um, it's closed form. Um, of course, in genetics, we cannot do this because <clears throat> p is the number of predictor, p is greater than the number of samples, n, right? So this matrix is not invertible, and you know, basically, you can't do this. So people look at this model and they go like, okay, um, instead of including every single predictor, every single SNP, um, what you can do is you can just look at one SNP at a time, right? For instance, the JTH SNP. And then you will just look at these SNPs one by one. <clears throat> and if this is your model, <clears throat> you still have the closed form solution and you can do hypothesis testing, right? Basically you test if the beta J is equal to zero or not. Um, <clears throat> there are a lot of tests and you can, you can, you know, you get p-values and then you can reject the null hypothesis using some criterion. <clears throat> and of course, this, the problem with this model is that it sort of assumes, except for the jth SNP, every other SNP is inside the epsilon term, right, which is assumed to have no effect on y. And <clears throat> of course, that's a tenuous assumption. 
So finally, people do these linear mix models, um, which is what I think most people do these today. And in this model, we still have, you know, we test these SNPs one by one, but the epsilon now has a more complicated structure where in particular you have two variance component, one of them being, you know, this XX transpose. So the idea is, even though you're testing these SNPs one by one, um, <clears throat> the effect of other SNPs are sort of inside the background variance. So it contributes to the, the variance. And if this is your model, you can still do hypothesis testing. So you can still crunch these p-values, but you have to pay a price though, right? You have to estimate these extra parameters, sigma g, sigma e, they no longer have closed forms. Um, you have to form this matrix, which is expensive for large data. And you have to, you know, do, do a bunch of other, uh, other stuff. But the main problem we have for this model is that it is, it is very difficult to extend this model to non-continuous phenotypes, <clears throat> right? If Y is binary or if it's a uh, count data, it's, it's less clear how to make this model work. You can do like GLMM models, uh, generalized linear mixed model. It's, it's more computationally intensive. So um, <clears throat> for these reasons, we think there are value in pursuing alternatives, which is in penalized regression. And our group has been doing that for, for a decade or so. So, <clears throat> In penalized regression, we do not give up on the naive model, right? You still want to sort of um, minimize this criteria, but you add some constraints. So here are some examples. For instance, the lasso is the most popular one. You minimize a convex loss plus the L1 norm of beta times a tuning constant. MCP is another one. It's similar to lasso. You just have a more complicated penalty. And um, so these two methods, basically they don't really work in GWAS, right? Or in genetics because, <coughs> because, because of shrinkage basically. So shrinkage causes some kind of ex excess false positives, false negatives. And so finally we arrived at this third alternative, iterative hard thresholding, IHT. And that's the focus today, right? What it does is it minimizes this this loss subject to a constraint. And this constraint is that your beta, your statistical model has K or fewer non-zero entries. <clears throat> um, so here's, here's um, how IHT works. So you wanna minimize some objective such that the number of non-zero entries of beta is less than K and um, you do that by basically repeating three steps, right? You start with the current guess, you move in the gradient direction for some step size. So that result will be a dense vector. <clears throat> and then you project that resulting dense vector to sparsity. And this can be done by basically finding the K largest entry of this vector in magnitude. You'll find those and then you will leave them untouched and everything else you can set it to equal to zero. So that's the projection. Um, for intuition, this is basically a fancy gradient descent, right? You're taking a gradient step and then you're taking a projection step. So repeating gradient versus projection and then you just keep doing that. So that's IHT. And <clears throat> we, do, so this is a complicated slide, but the, the key message I want to emphasize is that IHT can work with non-Gaussian phenotypes, right? If you have non-Gaussian phenotypes, we can model the phenotype Y as a generalized linear model <clears throat> where you model the expected value of Y. So you're saying the mean of Y is equal to a nonlinear transformation of your covariates, where this G is this um, smooth inverse link function. <clears throat> and if, if this is your model, you can write the likely the log likelihood a very in a very general way that looks like this, where a, b, and c's are just some functions that vary depending on the distribution. <laughs> so this model encompasses a lot of different kind of models, right? Like the the Gaussian, um, the binomial models, the Poisson. 
So you can model these count data, the binary phenotypes in, in this very general way. And it is also known that you can take gradients and Hessians like in this very, in this way. So given that we know this model, we can it, we can basically run IHT, right? If you want to run IHT, you just want some objective function um, to minimize or maximize. And you have to know what the gradient is, which is here. And you have to know how to calculate step size, which is given by the expected information. So <clears throat> this is essentially what we're doing. We, we, we extend the IHT to the GLM models, and then we apply it to these GWAS studies. Um, so, by the way, I just want to emphasize before I get into the results section that in these penalized regression literature, there's a lot of stuff that people like to do, right? For instance, how do you group variables? How do you weigh these variables? And we, we did a number of them. I just don't have time to cover them today. And we also did some computational um, tricks to, to speed up the calculation, right? For instance, how do you, how do you do a matrix vector multiplication efficiently if your matrix is genotypes. So usually it's compressed into the in this into two bits per entry, right? You, we can do that very efficiently. And we also have some efficient um, you know, how do you parallelize things, how do you standardize things? Um if you're interested, we, we can talk about this later. Oh, by the way, I forgot to say if if anyone has any questions, you can feel free to interrupt me anytime. But anyways, so this is our, our main result. This is a simulation studies. We are comparing IHT to, to lasso and uh, the marginal testing. So this is the, you know, the SNP by SNP independent SNP um, method. And we compared in terms of true positives and false positives. So we want this to be higher and false positives to be, to be lower, right? And so the conclusion is that IHT is, is better than lasso because lasso has so many false positives, right? Like um, on average, let's say Lasso finds 40 predictors, it, 30 of them will be false positives. So that's just too, too expensive to follow up on uh, in GWAS. And IHT is in summary better than these marginal tests because these marginal tests don't find enough true positives, right? There's, you, there's K true positives, but you know, I, marginal ones finds like about seven. IHT finds on the, you know more almost nine, right? So that's that's our simulation studies, and we try to apply this our method to this UK biobank result. Um, so this is a much bigger data. It has um, two hundred thousand samples and half a million SNPs. The phenotype is a hypertension phenotype. So we you know, we can measure people's blood pressure and then we dichotomize it so that we say, okay, this patient either has or does not have hypertension. So it's a binary phenotype. And so we compared to these uh, standard SNP by SNP association model, right? So remember each, the standard traditional model, you compute this p-value for, for every predictor. And those p-value you can, if you plot it in this, in this negative log 10 scale, You'll, you'll get a picture that looks like this. And if the p-value is small enough, it will, it will pass this blue line. So if it's taller than a blue line, it, traditionally we say we, we have a significant association. And for IHT, we found the ones that we found are circled in black, right? So essentially we find most of these very significant predictors, but we also find a lot of ones that are down here. And I, I mean, I personally think this is very interesting, right? Because these, these ones that are down here, clearly they are impossible to be detected by these traditional methods. And we think that's because you need to condition on the effect of these other significant ones, right? We're basically doing a multiple regression model, right? So, um, of course, that's, that's really great, but we, we need to avoid um, premature, uh, you know, excitement, right? So here are some criticisms that for for our method. So for instance, the number one, we will address this with with our next paper, 
but basically it says there's no super rigorous comparison of our method against the latest linear mix models, right? Up here, we compared it against the, the marginal, the snip by snip model, but this is not the, the linear mix model. So you don't have that variance term. And I mean, the reason for this is actually because historically these penalized regression methods um, kind of struggled to beat even the simple marginal methods, right? For instance, in this paper, we tried really hard with lasso using stability selection, um, but it, but it didn't work. So I guess you know, it's 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 a major milestone to beat the the, the marginal test. And the second criticism is that um, in in our UK Bell Bank, you know, basically we 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 say okay, these SNPs down here and they're they will be interesting because they can't be found by these other methods. But you know, we we don't we never follow followed up, so I guess we have no proof. And finally, this is the the biggest this perhaps the biggest concern, which is that these penalized regression methods they they have these very nice theoretical guarantees, right? They will converge and they will converge to the correct solution usually. But those guarantees don't work if your predictors are correlated, right? So for instance, in GWAS, if you have half a million SNPs, that's okay. Um, but if you have like 5 million SNPs, then maybe too, too many of those SNPs will be too correlated. So then, and in that case, we're not super sure how these methods will, will work. Um, so these are just some criticisms. Um, and um, finally, I want to highlight some of the possible future work that we can do. Um, Currently, we are working on this one, multivariate IHT. So that's every trait is Gaussian. So you can model the whole thing as a you know, you know multivariate Gaussian. Um, there are also a few other ones. Yeah, basically we're the only ones doing IHT. So um, I guess there's a, there's a lot of opportunity here. Um, if, if you're interested, please feel free to talk to us. Um, we'll, we'll be very happy. Uh, so this is the the first part of the talk. Um, is there is there any questions? Yeah, I, um, I'm I'm assuming that this you can uh, uh, include covariates in your model. That it's not just sort of a, a taking residuals from an adjusted model, but it's covariates for each. You mean non-genetic covariates, right? Non-genetic covariates or... No, we can include those. Yeah, okay. Um, so usually we can include principal components mm -hmm. to adjust for ancestry. Um, yeah. So can you clarify for me uh, how your algorithm for IHT differs from Eric Kawaguchi's uh, based on... Uh, so I'm forgetting the name of the algorithm that he uses. So I think he uses uh, he he. Let's see, he's he's doing competing risk, right? I think he does. Oh well, no, this is a different project. Oh he. Oh. Uh, he's Eric's not on, is he? Um, no, I think, but I don't uh, think so. Uh, but basically, his penalty involves uh, subtracting uh, the square of beta divided by the square of the previous estimate of beta in an iterative fashion. Mm -hmm. uh, and so basically, as you get to convergence, that's, that's basically going to be either zero or one. Uh, hence, it's still an L0 penalty. Okay, anyway, if you're not familiar, I can talk to you about that separately on, on another occasion. Okay, yeah, sorry. Um, sorry, I, one sorry, one more question about this is: Have you compared sort of the predictive ability of each? I mean, I know you show false positives, false negatives, and those trade offs seem pretty small. But if you looked at sort of AUC performance or other types of uh, mean squared error of prediction, do you see any difference in that? Um, um, hmm. So we 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 never did that. Okay. I, yeah. I mean, I know um, 
I mean, one of the big areas of the, the, the push right now in genetics is, you know, polygenic risk scores, which is a little bit more focused on sort of the predictive ability of a, set, of a handful of SNPs rather than the discovery of any given particular SNP. So. I see, I see. Mm -hmm. um, maybe, maybe we can add that to <laughs> future work. Yeah, sorry. No. Um, is, is there any other questions? So I guess I'll move on to the, the second part. Um, so in this project, we try to work on imputation and phasing. So these are also another big, um, big problems in genetics. So it's currently unpublished, but you can access our paper on archive and the software and documentation is, is similarly is here. So here's the introduction slide. Um, imputation really is, is a very standard process today. Um, this imputation server in Michigan, they impute 10 million genomes annually, right? So that's, that's you know, if you think about it, there's only 10 million people in LA. So every year you're basically imputing as many people as there are in LA. So the purpose of imputation, there's usually two, pur two main purposes, right? One is you can increase the number of markers you can test, right? For instance, in the GWAS that I was just talking about, there's usually like a million or so SNPs, right? But if you impute that 1 million SNPs, you can get it to turn it to like 10 million or 100 million SNPs. It's also used in meta-analysis, right? Where you have 10 independent groups, they did all of their GWAS, but you want to combine these results into a bigger data, right? To increase sample size. How do you do that? If you impute them to the same reference panel, you will you will basically get this data. Everybody is on the same set of SNPs, and then you can just uh, do the standard, you know, GWAS p-value crunching. So, for these reasons, imputation really is is huge today, right? So in this process, there's today there is uh, usually two inputs to to imputation. Right, one is your GWAS data. So that's usually, you know, the, the data I was talking about, 10 million SNPs. And you also have a, a reference panel. So here's the reference panel, here's the, the GWAS data. In the reference panel, you have many, many more SNPs, right? But you also have phase information. So what that means is every two row is, is one sample, is one sample of genotype, right? And so what's actually observed here is, you know, the sum of two, two, two rows. So if you give me these two data, what I'll do is I'll take, I'll first impute every single question mark in here. And then I will also tell you the phase information. So these twos, I can tell you, you know, these, these, these ones, heterozygous ones, I can tell you which chromosome the, the, hetero, the one is on basically. Um, so here's a little bit of background. So obviously how well your imputation sort of exclusively depends on the, the reference panel, right? You have to have a very big, very high quality reference panel. And so because of that, you know, people have been making these really big reference panels. And every, every year, basically, we're increasing the panel size by 10 times, right? Either in terms of the number of samples in the panel or the number of, the, um, the number of SNPs, basically. And Currently, the most popular methods that can take advantage of these panels are based on hidden Markov models. Okay, so for instance, Minimac 4 is a big one. That's what's used on the imputation server, but there are a few other ones. So all of these HMM um, methods, they're actually all based on the same paper, right? It's, it's this paper by Lee and Stevens. And so consequently, they have very similar accuracy, right? They're the same model, you know, they, they just they optimize the model differently. And the main problem, well, I mean, I guess another thing we should say is these methods, they typically require the data to be pre-phased. So they require us, the, the, the input to be, you know, you, you need to know if it's a one, which, which chromosome it's on. Um, but for us, it just means that you have to actually run this other software first before you can do imputation. And actually that's prephasing is usually slower. So, you know, it's, it's just, it's overall, it's 
we think there are value in pursuing alternatives. And so I should say one more thing, which is that these HMM methods, they're already on version four and five, right? They, they have you know, these decades where they constantly improve over themselves. But you know, since, since these reference panels are getting so big, we, we think there are value in trying to make a, a, a super fast method just to be able to get, get the extra speed. Um, sorry. So, so here's just a more concrete example of demonstrating that these HMM methods are, are quite, quite slow. So here I installed Minimac 4 locally. And remember, this is what's used on the imputation server. So if you do impute genotypes, you're probably using this, this software. So I used, I imputed 1,000 samples um, using the HRC panel. So this is the 2016 panel. And that take around 3.5 hours on chromosome 10. Okay. And this, this 3.5 hours is on, on this computer. Sorry, um, you can't see, but um, it, it's a good computer, right? It's a, we bought this computer last year. So if you want to do 23 chromosomes on, on the UK Biobank, which has half a million samples, it will, it will be a very big problem, right? It will take you four years. And this is not including the pre-vasing time, right? So real, realistically, it will take, I don't know, maybe 10 years if with one computer, right? But of course you can just buy like maybe a hundred computers or something to, to really speed this up. Or you can use our software. Um, it will take about 20 days on, on this computer. We, we also do not require these pre-phasing steps. We also need a lot less memory. <clears throat> and finally, we, we, we yield some extra dividends in these ancestry data and then some data compression step. So this is just some, some motivation for, for our software. Um, so before I get into the result, I want to spend two slides very quickly giving you an intuition of how imputation works in our software. So essentially you're looking at <clears throat> these huge chromosomes, right? But you only want to impute small windows. So let's say you're looking at a very small window of maybe 200 SNPs. This is the genotype vector. And because you're looking at a small window, the number of reference haplotypes can be collapsed down to D, D unique haplotypes. So D is usually a small number. <clears throat> if you want to do imputation, we minimize this least square criterion. And <clears throat> you can expand it so that it becomes this sum. And essentially you have to just search through all I and J combinations um, to, to, to find the best HI and HJ, right? That matches your genotypes. So to solve this problem, what we do is we collect these three terms involving the H's into a matrix M. And we collect the last two terms involving inner products of X and H into another matrix N. So these two matrices can be assembled very efficiently from these two matrix matrix multiplication for all samples. Once we have these two matrices, you, you ignore this term because it doesn't have anything to do with optimization. So you, if you want to know what IJ is, you find the minimum entry of this upper triangular matrix. And <clears throat> right off the bat, let me just say that, you know, actually com computing these two matrices are, are really fast because internally we can call these these BLAST libraries. It's actually this third step that's the computational bottleneck of our method. So just to give you an intuition, the bottleneck of our software is just how fast can you search the entries of a symmetric matrix? And that's that's really fast, right? On at least on modern computers. So that that's why we think our method is uh, is is very, very, very fast in terms of speed. And because we are looking at a small genomic window, right? We can sort of just treat every window independently. And that's how we do parallelization. So after we do this, we, we essentially have a bunch of windows, right? And e in each window, we know 
the two unique haplotypes that are best for, for that window. The next step is that we, but we want to be able to search all possible other non-unique haplotypes as well, right? So first we expand, we, you know, H1, maybe H1 is equal to three haplotypes in this first window. We expand them so that there are this set of matching haplotypes. And the second step is we, we need to do phasing, right? So we need to know which order these, these haplotypes come in. So we, this, this, this step is a, a little bit more, I guess it's a, it's a bit hard to explain, but the idea is we just want the haplotypes to survive for as many window as possible um, and switching order if that gives a better, um, extends the life of these haplotypes. For instance, H1 here survives for three windows, right? But there's no more H1 in the fourth window. So H1 is on the top strand. But H5 survives. First, it survives for three windows. And then on the fourth window, you can do a switch. So H5 can continue to survive on the bottom. And so... I'll ask a quick question. Sorry, I'm, I'm not clear what you mean by survives across a window. When you say H1 survives until the next window, oh, what do you I mean? See. Sorry. So what I, what I, basically, we, we in the previous step, we treat these windows as independent, right? But we now want to bridge the windows together. And we want to um, find these, these H's so that there's as little breakpoint as possible. So we want to connect them so that they're, they're long, right? So for instance, if it's H2 here, then it only sort of connects for, for two windows, right? Oh, I guess you can do a switch here. Um, well, I guess if, if you look at H3 then, right? It, you, you, there's no more H3 here, so you cannot do it on the second window. Uh, sorry, I guess intuitively, I'm just trying to say these, these haplotypes should be as long as possible without breaks. And we just do that by naively trying to do switches when, if that gives you a, a longer, a longer haplotype. Yeah, <laughs> sorry, this is just some, some detail. I, I think it's not super, super um, important. But okay, here, here's the, the, the resulting slide. Basically, we compared it against these two um, HMM methods, the two most popular ones, in terms of error rate, time, memory. And these two data are, are the 2012 panel, and these two uses the 2016 panel. So these are the bigger data. You should look here if, if, you, um, if, if you want to. Um, the basic takeaway is that we are a lot faster, right? Sometimes 10, 100 times faster. And we are a lot more memory efficient. But we, we have to pay a price. Um, currently, we are less accurate. We are two, two to three times less accurate. But in extremely bad cases, it can go up to four times less accurate. Um, so I, I just want to be honest there. But you know, just we have to look, right? So here, we're looking at an error rate of about one imputation error out of every 1,000 SNPs, right? The computing method is looking at 0.5 error out of every 1,000 SNPs. So it's, it's really not too big of a difference. Um, at least that's the story we're trying to tell. Yeah. Um, so that's for imputation and phasing. But we have a very interesting extension to, to this process, which is that in, in, the, you know, in one of the steps, I was talking about these H's, whatever. These H's are the haplotypes from the reference panel, right? But if you know the reference panel, if, if, if they are labeled, for instance, with their country of origin or with their ethnicity, then we can sort of decompose a sample's genotype so that you know, it, this genotype becomes labeled with whatever label was in the reference panel. So we call this process um, chromosome painting. Um, and it's, it's useful for these, these ancestry inference, right? So we tested this process on, on this data, 1000 Genomes Project. In fact, this is the 2012 reference panel, right? In this panel, there are 26 populations. A lot of these populations, like the British, we, they, they made very good effort to ensure that they are very 
close to 100% being British. But there are also populations like the Puerto Ricans, where just, you know, from the historical, you know, um, context, we know that these populations here are definitely admixed. So the experiment that we did was we just took these populations that we know are definitely not admixed, and then we use those as a reference panel. And then we try to infer the ancestry for these admixed individuals. Um, <clears throat> so this is the result, right? We look at that one chromosome, chromosome 18, and then the three admixed samples we chose was Puerto Rican, Peruvian, and a African American. So that's the you know Puerto Rican, Peruvian, and African American. So let me just pick the African American as an example. So you can look at this chromosome and be like, okay, he's mostly African American, right? Green color, most most of them are. But there are some small blocks right here and here, where this person's genotype is from European ancestry. And a very small blocks that, that are from Asian, which we think is an approximate for Amerindian populations. If you compute the cumulative length of these color segments, you can get a global estimate for the um, ancestry. Right, so for, for instance, the African-American is 80% African and 15% um, European and so on. And of course, we compared our estimates to the admixture program, which is it's also from our group, but it, it, it's, uh, it's pretty well known. And usually it gives very close estimates, right? The first sample and the third sample is, is reasonably close. But occasionally it will give different estimates. For instance, the Peruvian. Um, admixture thinks he's almost 97% South or East Asian. Um, which doesn't, I, I, I personally think that doesn't make a lot of sense, right? Whereas our estimates, we think this Peruvian is half European, half Asian, and Asian really in this context approximates the Amerindian populations. So, I, you know, I, I think our, our, our version makes a little bit more sense, which is not surprising because we are using a reference panel, right? Whereas admixture, they don't have the reference. So um, with that said, <clears throat> I want to highlight some possible future work in, in, in for, for these projects. All right, first of all, we can try to improve the error rate, right? Um, this is the first iteration of our software and there are a lot of things that only afterwards I thought of that might help in the error rate. So um, that might be interesting. We can also try to pursue the ancestry inference direction, which is what these slides are about. We, we, it, it's, it's sort of like a toy example in this current project, but we can try to be more, be, um, quantify it a little bit better. So here, here are some ideas for doing that. And then finally, it would be interesting if we can have another software to compare the output of our program versus these other H HMM programs, just because they are very different in, in, how, in how they do imputation. So there might be regions where one program does better than the other one, so we can sort of complement them. Or maybe there are regions that both of them struggle to do. So for those regions, we know to toss away. Um, so, um, this is my group at UCLA. Um, this person is my advisor, Ken, and this, uh, this is my other advisor, Janet. So it was, it, they really helped me tremendously in, in these projects. So um, with that said, I would like to take questions. Uh, can I can I start? You, um, I don't think I may have missed it, but I don't think you said what size window you're using for the imputation piece. I and think. I'd be curious to know the answer to that question, but also how both the accuracy and the computational efficiency vary as you increase the window. Both go up, presumably. But. Okay. 
So the short answer is the windows usually are between 50 SNPs to maybe 400 SNPs. They're usually in that range, but we choose these window with dynamically. So every window is chosen based on the number of unique capital types. So whether or not in that range, we expect a lot of diversity. So if there's a lot of differences among people, then we try to make the windows shorter, but otherwise we make the windows longer. Um, empirically, shorter windows is faster um, because this matrix M gets very big if, if you have a longer window width. Um, but will also be less accurate, presumably. <laughs> So actually, I'm not I'm not sure if longer window is less accurate, um, because yeah, I'm not sure because usually longer windows means there's less um, there there's there's less um, variability. So even though it's longer, it, it might sort of be easier a, a easier problem. I would have expected the longer windows to be more accurate, but just computationally is going to slow you down. Um, yeah, yeah, I'm not 100% sure. It will, if you increase the window width to be too long, for instance, it becomes like, let's say, you know, 10,000 SNPs, then it will definitely stop being too accurate. Yeah. Um, just because you can't minimize this very well anymore. Yeah, so there's a happy medium somewhere. So it has to be some, some, medium length. We don't have a very nice way of choosing it though. We currently choose it based purely on computational efficiency. So that might be another reason why our software is less accurate. Would, it, would overlapping windows help? It, it will. We do not overlap currently, but um, if, if we implement this, it, it will def almost definitely help the imputation error rate. Mm. So we, we could we quickly find out whether it's going to improve it, you know, to the point of being able to beat Minimac. Uh, sorry, can you say that again? Well, I'm just saying, you know, with your toy example, as you call it, uh, you'd quickly find out whether you can beat Minimac, I would think. Yeah, yeah. Probably not enough to beat their accuracy, but we can make the margin smaller, right? Instead of being two times, three times worse, maybe hopefully we can get it to like 1.5 times worse or something like that, but I don't know. Yeah. Um, so once again, thank you very much for um, letting me speak. Uh, are there any are there... any other questions? I'm assuming this is written in Julia. Yeah. Yes. Yes. Everything is in Julia. All right. Um, I have a question in chat. Let's see. Hold on. So the question is. L0 is not convex, so it doesn't guarantee a global solution, right? So IHT is, um, the, because the penalty is L0, um, it's not convex anymore. So it, uh, it, it's a greedy method, by, but it, it's not guaranteed to find the, the correct solution. Um, but in practice, it seems to work pretty well. <laughs> yeah, sorry. Any and other? The nice thing about, you know, the genotyping using this Michigan server is that, I mean, phasing, sorry, um, imputation using the Michigan server is that it's there, you know, and you just feed yeah. it your data and you don't have to worry about it. Are you, would you attempt to try to replicate that if you? So they have a very good system set up, right? You can just upload your data and then they'll do everything and then you can download it. Yeah. So it's it's going to be very hard to, to do that. <laughs> yeah. um, but yeah. I think if we can do a very good job of imputation, we might be able to convince them to adopt our code. 
I think that might be better in the long term for every, you know, because the biggest advantage I think to the imputation servers is the reference panels that they have sort of exclusive access and you can't, you, you can't access those on your own. It's only through the server, right? And um, so you get the, the benefit of having very large and diverse reference panels, but um, you know, it would be nice, you know, to have a, a fast option for imputation that you could do quickly, um, you know, and then, you know, if you needed to follow up regions or, or what have you, you could then try to do a different imputation that might be more accurate or something. Yeah, the server is currently offers unmatched convenience. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so we developed the methods, right? So that's, that, that's fine. Um, hopefully. No, that's great. Thank you very much. Um, all right. If there are any more great questions. Talk. Thank you yeah. very much. As that well. was wonderful. That was very interesting. Okay. Um, thank you all for joining us. And we have a, a talk next week too, right, Duncan? I can't remember. No, next week is oh, faculty meeting. Faculty, yes. And the week after that, I think, is a Jennifer Bob. Uh, okay. let me, let's double check that. Yes, Jennifer Bob from UW, Spatial Confounding and Longitudinal Studies of the Built Environment. So we'll have an epifocus one next week, I mean, an environmental focus one. Okay. Uh, two weeks. Two weeks. Okay. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. Thank all. you. And Ben, we'll, I'll, we'll be following up. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you very much. Yeah, no, thank you. Thank you. Thank okay. you. Thanks a lot. Bye. See you guys. Okay. Bye bye. bye.